Thank you for being here with us. I'd like to thank everyone for coming out tonight and thank the senators for, for having us. As Penyan Village Justice, I, I hear over 200 cases per month making Penyan Village Court uh, far and away the busiest justice court in Yates County. Of those 200 plus cases, well over 80% are criminal cases, and of those criminal cases, over half are drug related. Approximately one third of the drug related criminal cases I hear involve heroin directly. That's about one a day. Uh, additionally, not included in that statistic are cases that involve heroin indirectly, such as personal crimes, including assaults over drug deals gone bad, and property crimes, such as burglary and larceny to support a drug habit. As a local attorney for over 25 years, I both prosecuted and defended individuals caught up in the vicious cycle of drug abuse. I participated in the federally sponsored drug treatment court training, as Judge Falvey alluded to, uh, mandated at the inception of the local treatment courts a decade ago, and I have participated in the treatment courts in Yates, Seneca, and Ontario counties. As a sitting justice and a practicing lawyer, I urge a greater commitment to the education of town and village justices. I know of no town or village justice that I've talked to that wouldn't appreciate more training, and especially more training in the area of drug crimes. Specifically, I wish to note the dubious distinction that New York leads the nation in the percentage of town and village justices that are not legally trained. While this may have made sense 100 years ago, we are now dealing with heroin. We are now confronted with often sophisticated drug dealers who use cell phones and the internet in their drug trade. We are using an antiquated 19th century justice court system to confront a modern 21st century problem. I think it's shocking to know that New York requires only 12 hours a year of training for town and village justices, less than that required to be a licensed beautician or manicurist in the state of New York. We local judges are often called on to review search warrant applications, rule on complex evidentiary issues, and conduct hearings at the very outset of the beginning of serious drug cases. In drug cases, we have to be familiar with such terms as aggregate weight, possession with intent to sell, and the reagent test. An amateur judge, however well-meaning, is much more likely to make an error on a legal ruling or in the application of criminal procedure law than a lawyer justice. This sometimes results in big-time drug dealers going free because of some technical error on the part of an untrained local justice. I do see hope, however. At no time in my 25-year legal career have I seen more lawyer justices than I do now, and I know that we have lawyer justices in Seneca County, in Ontario County, in Wayne County, and I think this is the growing trend among New York's justice courts. I think it's time to level the playing field so that the judges have the same training and expertise as those who argue cases before them. We owe that to the crime victims as much as to those standing accused of crimes. Until lawyer justices are the rule and not the exception in New York, I urge the state to address this lack of training and education for town and village justices, particularly as it relates to drug crimes, to ensure that all offenders, including those caught up in the scourge of heroin, are dealt with fairly according to the law. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. And now we're going to shift over uh, to the right with our panel of uh, individuals uh, who have been impacted personally by uh, uh, the heroin uh, epidemic that uh, uh, we struggle with in our communities. And that panel is made up of uh, uh, Janet Heaven, Ariana Chadwick, and Donna McKay. Alexis Plus, Truth Farm, Devin Pierce, and Gail Owen. Um, Janet, are you comfortable with uh, leading us off? Thank you. Thank you for being here. Hi, my name is Janet Heaven. My husband and I lost our son on January 5th, 2016 because of heroin. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to tell our story. Our hearts are broken. Chad James Heaven spent two weeks in, in the ICU, Rochester General Hospital, starting on December 23rd, 2015, and ending on January 5th, 2016. His body was septic. He had an unknown infection. He had 105 fever. He had hepatitis C. 
His blood pressure was off the charts. He had a collapsed lung. He was never conscious during those two weeks in the hospital. The doctors were not sure what exactly happened. We had to make the horrible decision to let him go. It could have been a bad needle. It could have been a bad batch of heroin. It could have been an overdose. It could have been any number of things, but the end result was death. The reason I want to speak to all of you is to try and save other addicts, parents, family members and this, from this incredible pain and having to go through the horrific ordeal. We need to raise awareness and provide education, treatment and most of all prevention. Our son was a great, fun-loving child, full of life, fun and energy. Here are a few pictures of him. You won't be able to see them, but there they are. Um, no child hopes to become an addict when he grows up and no parent hopes to raise an addict. No human is immune to this addiction. The addict is not the only person affected by this horrible drug. When people try to, to help an, an active addict, they are setting themselves up to be hurt. A, a heroin user will lie, cheat, steal, pawn, and do basically anything to get high. Nice people will offer them a place to stay and the next thing you know, their money, jewelry, electronics are missing and the addict has moved on to the next kind soul trying to help this person who can tell a great story and get what they need. My good friend says, if a heroin addict's lips are moving, they're lying. This is so sad but true. Our son started out, started his experimentation with drugs in high school drinking pot pills. The STAR program, which is a boot camp for kids, maybe it was helpful, but not enough. He had some minor brushes with the law enforcement and the use of marijuana and pills escalated to a more powerful addictive drugs and most recently heroin. Parents and family members need to know what to do when their kids are using drugs, what their options are. Based on our experience, we feel long-term rehab, 90 days, is critical. After graduating from high school, our son joined the Army, and he loved being in the Army. He spent time in Iraq and excelled at being a soldier. He was stationed in Hawaii and later transferred to Colorado. He had two wonderful daughters who now have no father, and their mother is an active addicts still in denial. They both lost custody of their daughters because they were unable to get clean. Fortunately, the girls have been adopted by a loving family. We helped our son numerous times to get help. He had been in four different 30-day rehabs, was fine for a while after he got out, but could not stay clean. We need to help our, we, we try to help our son time and time again by giving him clothing, money, a car to drive, and a place to stay. When our son was clean and sober, he was awesome. When he was using, he was not a pleasant person and we lived in fear. He had been arrested a couple of times for stealing and was in jail for a, for a few days or weeks at a time. I can remember, as awful as this may seem, that I wish they would keep him in jail because I knew he had three meals a day and a place to lay his head at night. If I may, I'd like to talk about some myths and clarify them with facts on my own experience. Myth, heroin is cheap. Fact, heroin is not cheap. It cost my son numerous Xboxes, Playstations, TVs, furniture, jewelry, watches, phones, cars, and more. It cost him his dignity, his self-esteem, his self-respect, it cost him a decent apartment and all its furnishings, and sadly his daughters, it cost him his life at the age of 28. Myth, my friend gets it for me. The fact is your heroin dealer is not your friend. He or she is a heroin dealer. If he were your friend, you would be allowed to talk about it. If he were your friend, 
you wouldn't have gotten started in the first place because friends don't want their friends dead. Hold on. Okay. Myth. Heroin dealers look like thugs. And the fact is they can look like a choir boy, be well-spoken, well-mannered, very charming, and come from a decent home just like you did. Myth. Heroin is the ultimate high. The fact is while the rush last minutes withdrawal symptoms are always waiting for you. They include muscle and bone pain, diarrhea and vomiting, abdominal cramps, insomnia, restlessness, runny nose, cold flashes and goosebumps, sweating, involuntary kicking motions, racing pulse, high blood pressure, increased respiratory rate, and severe anxiety. Myth, I can handle it. The fact is, Chad James Heaven, December 18, 1987, to, one, to January 5, 2016, James and James and Janet have been parents who lost their son, Chad, 28, on, on January 5, 5, 2016, to heroin. Please feel free to ask me any questions, and I am open and honest and willing to share my thoughts and feelings. Thank you for your time. Wow, Janet. Thank you very much for uh, sharing that uh, with us, and we're so sorry uh, for what you've been through and for your loss uh, of your son. Uh, truly, uh, it's, it's an unbelievable account of the tragedy uh, of what we're dealing with here. So thank you so much for being here this evening. Uh, Ariana and Donna, you two are together? Or are you? No, I was going to talk first. Yes, okay. My name is Ariana Chadwick. I overdosed on January 7, 2016, and the whole experience was completely shocking in every way that you can imagine. There is the obvious, oh my God, what happened? Who are all these people in my house? Then it hit me, this overwhelming feeling of guilt and embarrassment, and the thought of, oh great, now I'm just a junkie to all these people. And it's that guilt and embarrassment that prevents so many from getting help, especially in these small towns. Our community has done a lot to get rid of that stigma. Now we actually need to put the resources together and offer ways for people to get help and make it easy to access. Finding the resources to get help shouldn't be such a difficult thing. With a problem this bad, the information on any resources to help with the substance abuse should be readily available. I think there sh should be a website that is a database of resources that you can search by county for the entire state. And patient facilities, outpatient, sober living, AA, NA meetings, substance abuse counselors, all of that information should be in one place because it is so overwhelming to figure out what is actually available in your area. I think we should offer a protocol to all hospitals in the state on how to deal with an overdose because it's quite clear they don't ex know exactly how to handle it in these small communities. I understand being firm with, firm with a patient in my situation, but the doctor shouldn't be talking about your condition so loudly that the entire ER knows what is going on with you. The hospital just didn't know what to do or say to me. A social worker didn't come talk to me. They didn't talk to me about detox or rehab facilities. All they did was hand me a packet of information that YSAC had put together and sent me on my way. Thankfully, I have a family that helped me nav navigate everything, but not everyone does. I think offering hospitals a basic protocol to handle an overdose patient will make it easier to make sure everyone gets offered the same information and care. I think an amnesty program would be beneficial to the addicts in our area. There were so many nights where all I wanted to do was go get help, but there is nowhere to go in our area at 2 in the morning. And if there is, the addicts don't know about it. The window to actually help someone isn't that big. They need to be able to get the help when they want it because it is so hard to talk yourself into taking that step and to find the motivation to try. <clears throat> I also want to ask you to take into consideration that what works in bigger cities might not work in real, rural communities like ours, that there probably won't be examples of program that were successful for communities like ours because heroin being such a big problem in rural areas is a relatively new thing. So we might just have to take a chance and t try different programs until we find one that fits. I understand that is frustrating from a legislative point of view 
because it is hard to justify spending on money on something that it isn't a guarantee. But if it helps just a few people, then it was successful, especially in the eyes of the family affected by this addiction. Thank you so much for allowing me to come Thank you, Ariana, for, for sharing that with you. I know that it's uh, not easy to talk uh, about that. Uh, it's not easy to talk in front of a crowd of people like this either. Um, Donna's with you. Did you have anything you wanted to add, Donna? Hi, thank you for allowing me to do this. Um, I'm here as a community member um, as well as an aunt to a recovering addict. Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to talk a little bit about the insurance. I know we already touched on that. Um, it, it's a big issue. Uh, when, when, and Ari's right, that when somebody goes forward and they say, I need help, they need it then. They can't wait 24 hours. They can't wait till the next week. They need it right then and there. Um, I was doing some, some research online uh, and I firmly believe that we cannot arrest our way out of this. Not saying that some people need don't need to be arrested. I'm, but I, I want to mention that um, also that the most um, most of the dealers around here are addicts themselves. You get in the bigger cities, then you have the ones who aren't addicts. But I'm pretty sure from what I've heard and the people I've talked to that. The, around here, they're addicts as well. So to the amnesty program, uh, I found one that uh, a chief of police in Gloucester, Massachusetts uh, created, and it's called Police Assisted Addiction and Recovery Initiative. Um, from what I've read, the program allows for people to bring in their drugs and drug paraphernalia and not be arrested or serve any jail time for possession. They are also immediately taken to a hospital or facility for detox and hooked up with an angel. The angel will be with them through the entire process to offer support and encouragement. And from there, other resources are available to help them continue with their recovery. Although I am told that they wouldn't be arrested or jailed if they walked in the Sheriff's Department here and asked for help, there's nothing that is set in stone. I believe that if it was put on paper and advertised and gotten around our community, that people would start to feel more comfortable and come forward for help. This program can help conquer two things, getting drugs and paraphernalia off the streets and getting help for those who want help. In my opinion, this would be a huge step forward. I also have done some research on sober living homes. Studies have shown that aftercare programs such as this can better one's chances at avoiding relapse and maintaining sobriety. According to a study that was highlighted in the Journal of Psychoactive Drugs, abstinence rates went from 11% to 68% over six and 12 month follow-ups. And another facility had an increase from 20 to 40% after just six months in sober living homes. These are great results considering the success rate for heroin users trying to quit on their own is a mere 4%. These homes are designed to offer clean, healthy, well-structured environment, peer support, healthy activities, freedom to make their own healthy choices, allows them to be responsible for themselves, and teaches the living skills like cooking and money manage management, which is so important, and offers a place for them to grow in success and self-worth. This, without a doubt, is worth it. Um, going to uh, elementary level, middle school level, um, as part of a prevention method, uh, I believe that our community center needs to have some activities for, for us to do, for where to take our children. We have nothing to take our children to. Um, I know they started uh, a weight exercise place, but I'm talking like pool, like a public pool, laser tag, something fun, roller skating, something to get, and not just thrown out there for anybody to walk into and just use, but to have it managed by responsible people and people who are overlooking and overseeing this. So it's also creating jobs. Just wanted to put that out there. 
Um, and, and I understand that this is a lot to ask, but is it worth it? Is it worth the price of our community members' lives to ignore that these these are real possibilities? And thank you. Hi, Donna, Senator Amador, and uh, you know you mentioned the initiative uh, from Massachusetts, and I think it's Patty um, that it what it spells out and uh, the task force, both Senator Murphy and myself, today we were in Oneana and talking to sheriffs that uh, implement this initiative. So it is here, it's something that we're going to be, the task force going to be looking at more into so that we can implement possibly some of the initiatives of that particular program and see how we can adopt it. You also mentioned uh, community center, and one of the things that Oasis has just announced was their clubhouse um, programs that they are starting to put in in specific regions. So um, with some time, hopefully, we'll see in this region, and I'm sure Senator Romero will be working on one, uh, a clubhouse be uh, brought into an area here in the 58th Senate District and that will help with uh, the community activities. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Donna, for uh, sharing uh, that with us and for your, uh, your involvement uh, with Ariana uh, in helping through this very difficult situation. It's uh, extremely important uh, to have uh, that kind of support, which is uh, uh, often uh, lacking in, these, uh, in many of these situations, but certainly not, uh, certainly not all. Uh, next uh, up, uh, Alexis, um, you ready to go? Hi, thank you. <clears throat> um, I'm going to read for a change. If I talk, I'll just keep talking all night. So, <laughs> um, I'm the mother of three sons, but today I'm here to tell you about my firstborn son, Jeff. Jeff was a good student, popular, and a great athlete. He was charismatic, kind, and always stuck up for the underdog. He was absolutely passionate about everything that he did. He graduated high school in 2004 and went on to college and even played football and wrestled there. Upon completion, he was a chef at excellent restaurants. He was very successful and he lived independently. In 2011, I got a phone call that my son had been arrested for house burglaries. My son, my son who was raised well and as far as I knew had never gotten in trouble beyond speeding tickets. I was devastated but even more so when I went, met with the public defender and when I said to him, my son couldn't have done this, he said to me, a lot of things that heroin addicts do don't make sense. You could have knocked me over with a feather. When Jeff got out of jail, he hooked up with a gal who had a toddler boy already. I had custody of this child more than once due to their active addiction and heroin use. Jeff and the mother wanted and attempted to get treatment on more than one occasion. We had times he was shaking and sweating on my couch, going into withdrawals while we called our local detox center every hour on the hour as they instructed us to do to meet the bed lottery. He did at one point get inpatient treatment in Syracuse, but he had to fake being suicidal to get them to keep him for an entire 21 days. And even he knew that that wasn't enough treatment. He begged me not to take him home, but they made me. He relapsed within a month. The gal became pregnant with my grandchild and shortly after my son was arrested and sent to jail again. I was given custody of her son and she entered treatment at an inpatient methadone clinic where she met a new fellow. He signed on as the father of my grandson when he was born in June of 2013. At that time, the child I had custody of was given back to her through county services. Jeff spent eight months in jail and was doing very well upon <coughs> relief. I truly felt like I had my son back. He had filed to establish paternity of his son and was anxious to have his life fully in order so that when he could see his son, he would be able to provide him with a wonderful home. My grandson was nearly eight months old when the judge finally ordered a DNA test. Two days later, and just one day prior to that scheduled DNA test, the baby died. He was accidentally smothered during an afternoon nap by the boyfriend. Needless to say, Jeff was devastated. Remarkably, he soldiered on maintaining sobriety for another six months, and I'll be forever grateful for that time with him. 
On Saturday, August 2, 2014, Jeff had his 10th class year reunion. So many people who saw my son said it was the greatest they had seen him look in years. Sunday, Jeff came over and we had a nice big family breakfast. Monday, Jeff went golfing with his dad and his little brother, John, and his girlfriend. Monday night, Jeff used heroin and it killed him. On Tuesday morning, just 18 months ago, they found my son's body. Every day, from the day that I learned I was carrying my son to the day of his death, he was loved. But love was not enough to conquer this addiction. I'm not sure what would have been enough for Jeff, but I know that he was not offered the types or lengths of treatment that we know to be effective. And there are types of a treatment and lengths of treatment that we already know are proven to be effective. We just don't offer it here. Though to us the cost of our loss is beyond measure, I have taken to providing the economics of the situation in case there is any confusion at all about the cost to society and the taxpayer and how truly logical and what economic sense it makes to provide effective and long-term treatment for anyone who seeks it. The cost of Jeff and his fiance's addiction are as follows. At least four separate criminal proceedings, a combined um, 11 months of jail stay between the two of them in two different jails, at least two criminal proceedings for the mother, at least four criminal proceedings for my son, 18 months of combined probation, two hepatitis, hep, hepatitis C treatments at $100,000 each. My son was hospitalized for sepsis and he nearly lost his arm. Those were unpaid medical bills. Methadone program for the pregnant mother. My son and the, his and the mother were both on social services and Medicaid at the time and he had a college degree. My son and the mother had many um, unpaid medical bills there was a negligence proceeding against my son and the mother for having her child in their care while they were in active addiction. These proceedings were run separately in family court and included four, four court-appointed attorneys, a county attorney, two county caseworkers, in addition to the court staff, and required over 20 appearances over the course of a full year. There was foster care for the boy uh, for eight months and not to mention all the emotional damage that that child has suffered. There's all the victims of the crimes that the two committed, family members, father, mother, brother, sister, grandmother was even stolen from, um, not to mention retailers. Family court custody proceedings for the little boy that I had custody of, which included four court appointed attorneys, a county attorney, a caseworker, in addition to the court staff. Between the custody hearings, visitation hearings, and violation proceedings, we were in family court over 40 times in the course of three years. The family had family services through the county for 18 months. And then finally, the county coroner and the child fatality review team to review the death of my grandchild, and then the county coroner for the autopsy of my son. These are a great cost to our society, and I'm quite uncertain that if my son and his fiance had been provided treatment, society would not have had these costs. I found an I founded an advocacy organization called Truth Farm. We work to reduce the stigma and raise awareness. We create, implement, and ad advocate for programs and policy change to have a profound impact on the opioid epidemic. Uh, we're responsible for implementing four PARI programs in our area. Um, one of the problems that we'll have in New York State with implementing the PARI programs is that our hospitals are not willing to participate as they were in Gloucester, Massachusetts, where they were willing to house um, people who were addicted until they could find treatment. In New York State, they're just not willing to do that. We also provide community response action plans, um, and we've developed a best practices uh, procedures for hospitals to handle overdoses. Um, unfortunately, hospitals aren't willing to do that and they need to be required to do so. It isn't time for a Band-Aid, it's time for a tourniquet. This epidemic is insane. Mothers are losing sons, fathers are losing daughters, siblings like my boys are left with the loss of their brothers and sisters for a lifetime. We're creating orphans at an alarming rate, which is anyone's guess what the consequence of that will be 20, 10 to 20 years down the road. Everything that we do 
aside from the things that I'm going to mention, in my opinion, are a waste of time right now. We have people right now who are dying and who need help and who literally ask for help. I met with three other mothers before coming here this evening. So there's four mothers at the table. Three of us, our loved ones, asked for help and sought help before they ever entered the criminal justice system. Our law enforcement folks are doing an incredible job trying to clean up this mess, but the problem is we need to help people before they get to the criminal justice system. And we need to give them the help that they actually need, not some sub-partial treatment. Everyone says that what started this epidemic was this whole idea that we needed to treat people's pain. The thing that confuses me is that we're not doing the same thing for people who are addicted. They go to the hospital after an overdose, they've been revived with Narcan, and they're in severe pain, and we do nothing for them. We need absolutely a New York State to offer humane, medically-assisted detox, and that needs to happen immediately. There are other states that are offering same-day evaluations. We need to do that in New York State. We need immediate access to treatment. This isn't a situation where a person can wait days or weeks for treatment. It's a matter of life or death. And I'm going to allow the senator to remain nameless, who told me that insurers are not going to allow this because he's sitting at this table. But I'm going to tell you right now, we absolutely have to require insurers to pay for the type and length of treatment known to be effective. I'm not sure why he's allowing insurers to tell him what we're going to do with our laws. And finally, we need to increase insurance reimbursement rates so that treatment centers can afford to open and operate in New York State. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, very much, Alexis, for sharing this with us uh, and your difficult situations that you've been through and, and your uh, um, excellent ideas uh, for us moving forward and your experiences in other states is very helpful uh, as well. So thank you for being here with us tonight. Uh, next, we have Devin. Thank you, sir. 